Hey, Four C Divers, welcome to Facebook Live. Thank you all for joining in today. We want to know who is here with us. It is August 19th, 2021, and we want to know who is listening in. Say hello to us. Give us a uh, thumbs up, smiley face, or a heart emoji. Let us know that you are here. And also in the comments section, go ahead and type in where are you listening in from? Are you here in Florida? Are you outside of Florida? Are you outside of the U.S.? We want to know. All right, so let's check in. It is August, you guys, and wow, it is still gorgeous diving right now here in South Florida. We have nice warm waters. We've been having nice blue waters, and it's also been the start of our Goliath Grouper season. So the Goliath Grouper aggregations has started, guys. We were out, if you saw some of the photos we posted from last week, we were out and we had about 10 Goliath Groupers on the Corridor Rec Trek in Palm Beach. And some of our divers have been reporting up in Jupiter as well. So if you are interested in going out and seeing Goliath Groupers with 4C, give us a call at the shop or join one of our event dives. Go to our website, www.force-g.com, and go to the event tab. You'll see we have not just three trips that we've planned, but it's actually, there's a fourth one. If you're a female and you want to go diving with us, we have a ladies only diving to go to the caster in Boynton. That's uh, uh ladies only. Sorry guys. <laughs> All right. So everyone's saying hello. Everyone say hello to Angela Collins. Hi, Angela. Hey everybody. <laughs> All right. Before we let her start, you guys know the uh, drill. You got to make sure that you're registered for tonight's event on the Eventbrite. If you are not, if you're not registered by 645, that's the cutoff. That's when we take all the names, we put them into a random name picker, and we do a drawing to see who the big winner is for the night. We're going to be raffling off one of our Goliath Grouper event dives, so you can get a spot on one of those. So if you guys are wanting to win, make sure to register before 645. All right. So, guys, you know, we have these big fish. So we have titled tonight's presentation, The Big Fish Story. We're going to be talking about Goliath groupers. And we've got Angela Collins here to give you guys information about these animals, the biology, the life history, uh, the conservation, and what's going on with FWC. So I'm going to let her introduce herself and everything else that she does. And uh, go ahead, Angela, take it away. All righty. Thank you so much. I'm really happy to be here with you guys today. Um, I am excited to talk about Goliath Grouper. Uh, I wanted to kind of give you a little bit of background on me. Um, a lot of this work that I'm presenting today is uh, from work that I did as a biologist with Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. I was there as a fisheries biologist for over 10 years. Um, but to, today I am now with the University of Florida and Florida Sea Grant. I am a Sea Grant agent on the west coast of Florida. So um, if you need to get in touch with me, you can find me on the Sea Grant website um, or uh, shoot me an email anytime and we can talk about any of the reef fishes that you wanna talk about. So while um, I am talking about this fish. Before we get too much into the weeds with Goliath Grouper, I just want to give a shout out to Florida Sea Grant. This is a university-based program um, that supports education, research, and extension all throughout the state of Florida, basically doing work to support our coastal communities and enhance economic opportunities in those coastal communities throughout the state, to use good science to provide input and data. Um, that we, sea Grant has its input in all kinds of stuff. Um, we're a partnership uh, with the Florida Board of Education, NOAA, um, as well as Florida citizens and local governments. And then we are based at the University of Florida. So if you don't know much about Sea Grant, I encourage you to check us out at flcgrant.org and you can find out about all the different kinds of things that you have agents working for you on issues about coastal communities throughout the state of Florida. So let's talk about Goliath. Goliath grouper are one of those fishes that are intimately connected um, to both inshore and offshore habitats in Florida. This is one of those quintessential Florida fish. Okay, these guys start out in our estuaries in the um, mangrove habitats. They love mangrove habitats as babies. They gradually move offshore 
with growth. Um, and then they do form these spawning aggregations at offshore reef habitats in deeper water, typically somewhere between 120 to 160 feet is where most of those spawning aggregations have been noted. Some are a little shallower, some maybe a little deeper, but for the most part, those spawning ags are like right in that 120 to 150 foot range. The adults um, release eggs and sperm into the water column. They have external fertilization. Those eggs and sperm meet, make a little baby goliath grouper, and those little planktonic um, larval goliath grouper float through the water column for about 30 to 45 days, which is pretty typical for a lot of our reef fish species until, if they're lucky, they settle in a good nursery habitat like our mangrove estuaries, Tampa Bay, Charlotte Harbor, Indian River Lagoon, 10,000 Islands. These places with mangrove habitat are really important for our goliath groupers. They stay in those estuaries until basically those bodies are too fat and big to fit under those prop roots anymore, and then they do gradually move offshore with growth. <clears throat> this is a species that has historically always had a center of abundance in Florida and specifically the southwest coast of Florida. When there was a commercial fishery for Goliath grouper, the majority of landings took place on the southwest Florida coast. Um, so this is a, a Florida species, but their range does extend throughout the Caribbean, down the Central American coast, and also there is quite a few Goliath grouper along the northern coast of South America and in Brazil. Historically, um, there was a population of Goliath grouper over here on the west coast of Africa, but we believe that this population has been pretty extirpated because there have been um, no records of Goliath caught over here for quite some time. Um, so again, their range again is, is throughout the Caribbean. Center of abundance, though, has always been the southwest coast of Florida. Um, and that's probably because, as I mentioned before, this extensive nursery mangrove habitat that the southwest coast of Florida is fortunate enough to have. Um, and because of the Everglades National Park, we do have this lovely area in this, you know, southwest Florida that has extensive mangrove habitat still. You look at a satellite image of most of our estuaries and a lot of our shoreline in Florida has been developed. A lot of mangrove habitat is no longer where it used to be. And the actual loss of mangrove habitat as nursery area has been suggested as one of the potential bottlenecks to the full recovery of the species because there's just not as much nursery habitat as there used to be. But we are lucky again to have the Everglades National Park down here, 10,000 Islands, really good Goliath grouper nursery habitat down there. This is a fish that lives a long time. <clears throat> you guys are all divers. You know that um, they get really big. We know they can approach lengths greater than seven feet. We know they live at least 30, at least they can live to 37 years, but they probably live well into their 40s or 50s. Um, they have relatively late maturity, like a lot of our grouper species do. These guys don't mature until later in life, so at least four to six years of age. And in a Goliath grouper, that age corresponds with a total length of about three feet. So it takes them quite a while before they can start making more baby Goliath grouper. <clears throat> We're pretty certain that Goliath grouper are capable of changing sex, and they're probably like most of the groupers. If they do change sex, they will start out as female first and then switch into a male. But it doesn't appear to be an obligatory thing where they all change at some point, um, but they do seem to have the capability to change sex. They're sedentary. Um, they do have very strong sight fidelity and maintain um, positions within the same area for extended periods of time. And they form predictable aggregations. So the spawning aggregations that people can find, they do form them predictably every year, but they also aggregate predictably throughout the year on high relief structure and habitat. Um, and so, and as I mentioned before, their depth range, even the spawning aggregations of the adults, even though it's kind of deep for us it, in the whole scheme of things, they're really not that far offshore, you know, 120 to 150 feet in the, on the Gulf side, it's way farther off than on your side. Um, but all of these life history characteristics make Goliath grouper quite vulnerable to fishing pressure and overfishing. And in fact, they were overfished quite dramatically through the 80s. Fisheries for Goliath grouper have existed for over 100 years. I mean, people used to catch them, but it wasn't um, really high numbers of fish being landed until probably the 80s, when late 70s, 80s, when the price of meat also went up. And at the same time, we had technology advancing to a point that it was people were able to access this fish more easily, right? Our dive gear was getting better 
recreational divers could um, more easily take them via spear. Um, they had technology like Loran and bottom finders that were improving quite a bit. So it was much easier to um, find them offshore and, get, and, and access them. So uh, 80s, the fishery was quite overfished and there was a noted dramatic decline in the population. Um, and actually, you know, a lot of anglers, commercial and recreational, as well as divers noted this, you know, decreasing abundance of these fish. And um, there was a call, like an emergency call to do something about it. And there was an emergency closure and Goliath grouper were protected from harvest in 1990. Protection for Goliath grouper remains in place at this time in U.S. waters and in multiple places throughout their range. Um, and they were on the species of concern list with the National Marine Fisheries Service um, until 2006. So I bring this up because a lot of times people wonder about the endangered species status of Goliath grouper. And that is kind of a tricky question in the US. They were actually never listed as an endangered species with the US endangered species list, but they are listed internationally as critically endangered with the IUCN. <clears throat> so internationally on the IUCN red list, they are listed on the US endangered species list, which is a different thing. They, are, they, they aren't listed, but they were a species of concern um, as regarded by the National Marine Fisheries Service until 2006 when they were removed. With the removal of them from this list and also the noted um, rebound of numbers of Goliath grouper at certain sites throughout the state led to these sort of conflicting public perceptions on the recovery of the fish. And there is more and more pressure as time has gone on to potentially reassess the management strategy for Goliath grouper in Florida. But there's two sides to every story, right? So as the fish has recovered, we definitely hear from anglers that Goliath grouper can be a bit of a nuisance at some sites. They are opportunistic predators and they will absolutely um, take a fish that's struggling on a line. Um, and there's a perception from some that maybe this large size, um, they might be eating too many things and the presence of Goliath grouper might negatively impact other species. So these are sorts of the things that you hear on one side of the story, right? But then there's another side to that story and that we know Goliath grouper enhance habitat when they are present. Um, a lot of groupers actually do because of their behavior. So groupers like to get under structure, into the ledges, they keep spaces open on reef habitats. So just by them being in and out of a spot, um, think of those natural ledges with the caves, right? Groupers coming in and out of there actually move that sediment around, kind of keep it cleared out. They keep wrecks sometimes from filling in. Um, so just having them swimming in and out can actually enhance the habitat. And there have been studies that have demonstrated that a Goliath grouper being present can sometimes actually enhance the diversity of the other species that are on that site. There have been some economic impact analyses that have looked at the dive industry specifically and found that um, Goliath grouper has quite positive impacts on um, the economics within certain spaces where divers are able to see them. There's also a targeted catch and release fishery for Goliath grouper in Florida, especially people come down here and want to catch a big, big, big fish. And so um, there are captains that specifically target Goliath grouper for catch and release. And the other thing that I always just have to bring up when people are, are complaining about this species is that we have to remember that Goliath grouper are native. They evolved here. They co-evolved with all of our other fishes that are present. They're not like a fish that came in um, recently, like the lionfish, you know, that isn't supposed to be here. Goliath grouper historically have been here, been present on our reef habitats, have co-evolved with these other fishes. So it's just sort of something to keep in mind as the population is recovering. And so one of the things that make Goliath grouper have this interaction that can sometimes be perceived as negative with fishermen and with some spear fishermen is that they do interact. And as I mentioned before, they're opportunistic predators. So they will happily take um, a fish that might be on, a, on the end of a shaft or a fish that might be on the end of a line if it's swimming in front of their face. They have these beautiful big mouths, right? So Goliath grouper are suction feeders. They have a huge buccal cavity, that big old mouth that when it's closed, um, but then rapidly opened, that rapid opening of the mouth um, 
sucks whatever's in front of their face right into that big, beautiful buccal cavity, right? So that's how they're able to suck in really big stuff. Um, if it's struggling, people say, oh my gosh, I can't believe that fish just ate something that was so big. They do have really big jaws and they're capable of handling big prey, but naturally their diet is dominated by small benthic associated organisms. So crustaceans, um, benthic, small associated benthic fishes, think like batfish or um, stingrays or things that are um, down near the bottom. They also eat a lot of small bait fishes. If you think about Goliath grouper um, on these sites with all of these bait swimming around them, right? It's like swimming in a, a jar of peanuts. They just open their mouth and they can suck in quite a bit of that bait fish all at once. Um, and so naturally that probably they eat pretty low on the food chain but again that isn't to say that they won't take something big like a big grouper or a big snapper that's on a line and has nowhere to go but naturally they're probably not swimming around stealing i mean getting those fish you know chasing after those fish naturally but they will easily take one if it if it's if it's easy easy access we do know that they can modify their feeding behavior based on what the prey is doing, based on some cool feeding work that we did to sort of like get a handle on how Goliath Grouper were interacting with fish that were on anglers lines. And I'm gonna play a video here and I hope that it comes through um, relatively easily and it's not all broken up, but I'm gonna orient you real quick to what you're gonna be looking at. So if you look over here on the right side of the screen, you see this Goliath Grouper head. If you look at the bottom of the image, there's like a circle, this is a weight. And you can't see it, but there's clear monofilament basically coming up. That's uh, there's a big float up here, but there's a fish tethered to this line. And we're gonna we're gonna film this Goliath grouper eat this fish that's tethered to that line. Okay, so here we go. So the fish comes in and then sucks the fish up and then realizes it's tethered and spits it right back out. But that happened pretty quickly, right? Okay, so. That fish was moving. The Goliath grouper decided he wanted to eat it. He came in and took it really fast. Now we're going to watch what they do when the prey is not really moving around, just sort of laying on the bottom. And I just sort of show this, um, you know, it has some interesting research value, but mostly I just think it's fun to watch these guys um, with this, this uh, bait that we put on the bottom for, oops, sorry. Hang on one sec. All right. So, Watch the fish, the bait is down here on the bottom of the screen. And he sort of sees it. It's coming in. Very gradual. Notice his friends are like, are you gonna eat that? Trying to decide whether or not they wanna take it. I'm gonna take this point He's gonna eat it here. His friend got too close for comfort. Look at this fish here, he's got a tag on his back. This is one of our acoustically tagged fish. So that's just kind of a cool thing. You can see that one was tagged like the year before and that tag has kind of got a little biofouling on it, but still in pretty good shape. Now this fish that's swimming toward the camera, take a look at that jaw. You notice he's got two liters hanging out of his mouth. He's got some lip injury here. This is at a site where the Goliath grouper are quite often interacting with anglers and taking stuff off of lines and breaking leaders um, here and there. So this is a, a common issue, especially on the west coast of Florida. A lot of those fish on those sites have lots of lip, lip jewelry. And so there are some of these potential impacts of interactions with anglers. It's annoying for the angler and it's also potentially damaging for the Goliath grouper. There are side effects, you know, obviously it's a really big fish. You're pulling them up by the jaws. So there is gonna be sometimes damage to the jaw. You can see down here in this bottom, bottom left picture. Um, at the deeper sites, you will often see barotrauma in individuals, so they need to be vented properly. If they're vented or descended, they do great. They have very good survival if they're handled properly after their barotrauma event. Um, they do eat a lot of fishing gear. So in this bottom right image, I show it because this fish had um, had barotrauma. We were working it up for part of a tagging project and you, in, inside the stomach was all of this line and this hook is not ours. It was just a hook that was already in the stomach. So they do ingest quite a bit of um, fishing gear. And there's potential for this to um, you know, result in delayed or immediate mortality depending on the situation and the interaction with the angler. 
So what's the current status of the population in Florida? That's a, that's a question we get all of the time. There are a lot of excellent researchers working on this fish throughout the state um, and the Caribbean. Um, they are, there are academic institutions, management agencies. This is a fish that's actually been pretty well studied um, over the past 20 years, but we still have data that are important to gather um, that we're, we're lacking for this fish. And I'll go into that in a minute. But we know that in Florida, the juvenile abundance is increasing for sure. We know that through ENP creel surveys, but I put an asterisk beside that because we have these stochastic environmental events like red tide and cold snaps. Those are unpredictable sources of mortality. Goliath grouper do not react well to either one of those things. Um, we get a lot of dead Goliath grouper during extended red tide events. And we also, if we have extended cold, which we haven't had since 2010, but when you do have one of those extended cold fronts, a lot of Goliath grouper are impacted and we get a big source of mortality from those two environmental type things. And then there's also the consideration, as I mentioned before, there is diminished availability of nursery habitat overall that might act as a bottleneck to complete recovery of the fish. We also know from anecdotal observations, from research, from folks that have been monitoring the same sites for years is that adult numbers have been increasing since protective measures were put into place. So they are responding very encouragingly and very well to protective measures. However, the traditional stock assessments that NOAA and FWC perform on this species continue to fail because there's this lack of traditional data that go into those stock assessments, right? So stock assessments for marine fishes, often a critical part of that is information that you get from landings, right? From fish being harvested. And because Goliath grouper haven't been harvested since 1990 or before, um, that lack of traditional data has sort of stalled traditional stock assessment attempts. Um, so the population recovery estimates continue to rely on directed research efforts to inform them. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of those um, that I've been involved in. Again, there are lots of different groups doing Goliath Grouper, great Goliath Grouper work throughout the state. So I'm going to just mention some of the ones historically that I've, I've, I've been involved in. A lot of these um, assessments of Goliath Grouper have involved underwater visual surveys. Diving is an excellent way to see this fish. This is one of those species that's easily approachable. They're very identifiable. Um, you can get a lot of really good information just by, because they're so approachable underwater, which is one of the reasons the dive industry loves these fish so much. Conventional tags, um, like you can see in this picture down here on the bottom right, this is one of those um, conventional ID tags. It's large, it's a livestock tag. We um, apply it to the fish with a dart and hopefully Divers can see that number. It's big enough that divers can see it underwater and report back to FWC if they do see fish with big tags like that. And then acoustic movement is something, it's just a, a technology that has skyrocketed over the past three decades. We're able to like get really awesome, awesome data on um, where fish are moving using acoustic telemetry. So that's another method that has been used to assess what's going on with Goliath grouper. I'm gonna say a couple others that aren't on this slide, but um, is becoming more and more utilized by different places, including FWC, um, is things, genetics. You can use genetics to assess um, theoretical population size and also population connectivity. Um, so things like that are being explored and those data are informing managers as we speak. So this is kind of where my backyard is, okay? I'm on the west side of Florida, Tampa Bay area. Um, and for quite a long time, we've been doing a lot of visual survey work at a combination of artificial and natural reef habitats, everywhere from like inside, in shallow water, um, out to the Florida middle grounds and, and deeper areas. So a lot of survey area on the central west coast of Florida, kind of getting an idea of, of some behaviors and, and, and distributions of Goliath up here. Um, a lot of this was done with camera work and visual survey. Uh, a, you know, I'm sure you guys are all familiar with the ability to measure fish underwater with a video camera and videography is another one of those technologies that continues to just exponentially evolve. Um, but if you have lasers equipped to the camera, you know those lasers are a certain distance apart. You can take video of Goliath, get back into the lab, and actually take your still frames out of the individuals that you saw. You hear the two little dots right here. You know those are 20 cent centimeters apart. Easy free image analysis 
program and you can calculate the sizes of the fish that you observed. And this is important because it gives you an idea of the size distribution of the fish that are present, right? So this is a fish that doesn't mature until it is three feet long, right? So they can't reproduce until they're about three feet long. So if you go out there and you see a ton of really, really big fish, that's good news for the population because you know those are probably relatively older. Those are probably contributing to reproduction for the population or for that area. Um, but if you go out and all you see are the little ones, you have to think about how that it's gonna take some time for that population to continue to come back. And this is just kind of fish in general. But um, this, you know, measuring them underwater is pretty easy because you can get so close to them. And, um, you know, you can, as long as you have good viz and there's not too many bait fish surrounding the Goliath grouper that you're trying to film. So I'm just gonna show you tagging underwater. We've tagged Goliath, people tag them at the surface after catching them, they tag them and then you can also tag them underwater. And um, folks have been doing this method of tagging for quite a long time with this fish. You work with a good spear fisherman um, and you can tag them underwater. So here's another short video. Um, here's the fish here, just kind of hanging out by the anchor line. And you're gonna see a guy with the spear gun come in here on the, on the right side of your screen. And it's a modified shaft, so it doesn't go in too deep. Um, you just kind of get up behind the fish. You wanna work with somebody who knows what they're doing so they have good aim and it's a little prick. And then, you know, you hopefully have that tag in the fish for an extended period of time and you can get some information about resightings. Okay, so those conventional ID tags are great for if sites that get dove a lot, people that are on them a lot, people can report the information. But acoustic tags, allow you to actually see what that fish is doing within the water column all the time. So even when you're not there, even when you're not getting reports, you can actually see what's going on with the fish. So an acoustic tag on a fish, we, we put them on externally. Some people surgically implant them. But over here, you can see this red circle and there's a little acoustic pinger inside that red circle. And that's about the size of my thumb. And that little pinger, every minute and a half, goes off and basically says, this is my ID, this is the date, this is the time, and this is my depth. So um, you can get an idea of where that fish is within the water column. You don't only know that it's present, you also know that it's moving and what it's doing throughout the day. So you can get some like really cool data on diel patterns. What do they do at nighttime? Are they hanging out inside the wreck on the bottom or are they up near the top? They, 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 they do some cool things when the thermocline sets up. You can see what they do. You can actually capture catch and release events sometimes because you see them go up to the surface and then come back down. Um, so you can get a lot of really cool detailed information from acoustic tracking. We've had fish tracked at spots specifically. I mentioned they have, they're relatively sedentary. They can stay in the same spot for years. Um, we had a fish that was actually at a site for 736 days in a row. Didn't go anywhere. It was at that spot every day, every hour of every day we detected on the shipwreck for 736 days in a row until the battery on that tag wore out. That fish is probably still there. So they do have very, long residence times at the sites that they choose to be on. So habitat really does seem to matter with Goliath grouper. They do like structure, as I've mentioned before. Um, you're way more likely to see Goliath grouper at artificial habitat than you are to see them over um, low relief natural bottom. The higher relief you get in the natural bottom spots, the more likely are you are to see a Goliath grouper. But the artificial reefs hold Goliath grouper, the high relief artificial reefs specifically hold larger numbers of Goliath grouper. So they do seem to prefer structure. And again, the artificial reef habitats is, is a pretty common place to see them. And this is just sort of a scatter plot. I like to throw it out there to sort of impress upon people that you can see anywhere from no Goliath grouper to 25 Goliath grouper on a site. Um, but on average in our study area, we typically saw about four to five fish per artificial reef. Um, this again can go way up to over, you know, dozens of individuals, but then um, on average at most, you know, general artificial reefs across the board, we would see around the somewhere between four and five fish. But when you look at natural habitat, much lower numbers, 
the habitats, again, on the West Florida shelf that we are diving are typically low relief, natural reefs, natural ledges that are relatively low relief. So just lower abundance, lower likelihood of seeing Goliath grouper on those sites. So I wanted to sort of like go into some little fun information on some of the data that we get from the acoustic pingers, because I think that this is kind of cool insight into, you know, the, the, the day and night of a Goliath grouper when we're not in the water with them. We know from the spot off of the Tampa Bay estuary, we had wrecks with receivers on them out to about 130 feet. Um, and we know that the fish move in between sites. For the most part, they stay put. Most individuals stay at the same site, but some fish do move around and they'll move from shipwreck to shipwreck. And a lot of times they'll go to one shipwreck and then they'll come back to that original shipwreck that they we, that we tag them on. But we do see this cool movement between sites and we can get some information on how fast they move. And I just kind of throw this out there for if, if there are any runners out there. Um, we've seen rates of movement as high as about five kilometers an hour um, for some of these fish moving at these locally locally tracked spaces. And I put this graph up here to give people painful um, experience. I'm not trying to annoy you with this graph. I promise it has a point, um, but I'm going to walk you through it and you're going to be so happy that I talked to you about it. So along the Y axis here, we have all these different Goliath grouper. Okay. And then we have th two years of data kind of smushed onto this one graph. But what I want to point out here is that each one of these individuals, you see these little dots next to their number, like individual 79, he was at his spot for like five, six months, and then he left and then came back to that same spot and was there for nine months and then left again. And 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 you, if you look down this graph, you can see like a lot of our fish left their spots at, a, at around the same time. Not all of them, but a lot of them did. And the ones that were leaving were the ones that were sexually mature size. And the times that were they were leaving were the times that corresponded with the known spawning season for Goliath grouper on the west side of Florida. So we had the seasonal distinct departure of our mature sized individuals during spawning season from the wrecks that they were typically resident on. And then they would come back to their home wrecks, which is just kind of just cool data, right? <clears throat> and then I'd just like to include this cartoon because every presentation needs a cartoon. This is a fish that we caught in about 100 feet of water. It was a really big individual. It had very severe barotrauma, so we had to vent it a couple of times. We were very worried about this fish, but it ended up providing some amazing data. After we left that wreck that day, it stayed on that site for about six months. And then he swam down here. And serendipitously, C Chris Koenig from FSU had a receiver on this wreck off of Naples. It captured this fish's presence. The fish was there for two weeks during spawning season was 174 kilometers away from, from its home site. And then this is the cool part. It decided to come back home two weeks later and it traveled. We detected it at one of our Southern wrecks at the Southern part of our array. 100 miles it traveled in three days, which is pretty fast for something that's shaped like a potato, right? So these guys, when they wanna book it and go back to where they came from, they can move very quickly. And there's similar data like this um, for a lot of the fish that have been tagged on the East coast of Florida. Um, at the spawning aggregations over there showing on the on the fact array how they can definitely move during spawning season at a pretty rapid pace. Um, I just wanted to point out here that we can look and see that fish get get recaptured. So this is a fish. You can see it get captured here. This is one day, April 13th, that fish was caught. You see it up here at the surface. We put a tag on it. It comes back in and it just sits down there on the bottom for a few hours, like, whoa, what just happened, right? And then it starts moving around on day two and then up and down within the water column on day three. Two weeks later, fast forward, we caught that exact same fish again at that same spot right here. See that? At lunchtime, it, it didn't learn from its tagging experience. We caught it two weeks later, same spot, and you can actually see the fish come up to the surface when we caught it, and then it goes back down into the system and just kind of does what it does sitting on the top of the rack. So that's just some of the sorts of data that we can get from some of these acoustic monitoring um, explorations. So because this is a great forum to talk about how divers can contribute to the data collection effort, I would be remiss to not talk about the great Goliath grouper count. Okay, this is a 12 year and counting event. This started as a very regional initiative on the Southwest, southwest coast of Florida, and it was a partnership 
between Florida Sea Grant and Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. We started this 12 years ago, and the goal was to involve citizen scientists in data collection process, right? And so what we do is we recruit volunteer divers to follow a specific protocol and go to their favorite sites during the first two weeks of June, every June, um, anytime during those first two weeks, and take data on the presence and size distribution of the Goliath grouper at those spots. Okay, so this gives us this really broad geographic coverage and a very short time frame, and kind of provides a snapshot of Goliath grouper abundance in Florida. Having the citizen science, we can allow the stakeholders to provide data that can hopefully be contributed to the management process and be a useful part of, of management's regime. And the data were used in the last stock assessment. It was just a tiny piece of a huge puzzle, but the, the data from the Great Goliath Grouper Count were utilized during the last CDAR for Goliath Grouper. So um, I like to just bring that up for citizen scientists that might be interested in participating in the Great Goliath Grouper Count. If you're interested, you can contact your local Florida Sea Grant agent for more information flcgrant.org is the Florida Sea Grant website and you can find your local agent there and they can give you lots of information on Goliath grouper count in Florida. And this is just kind of, you can't really see the dots very well, but I want to point out that we've had participation. It started in 2010. It was mostly the west coast of Florida. But over time, you start seeing more dots show up. But we really don't have that many dots from the east coast. And we would love more participation in the east coast. This is um, a preview of this year's count. We had a ton down in Miami-Dade County, thanks to the awesome efforts of our partners down there and our, our Sea Grant, Anna, who is in Miami-Dade. Um, and then we, we had a lot more in the panhandle this year than we normally do, which has been awesome. Um, so the, these are just still preliminary data are still coming in from this year's count, but um, that's sort of just like a snapshot of some of the information that we're getting. So I'd be really happy. I can see the chat is active. So if there are any questions, I would love to talk to you guys more about Goliath Grouper, answer any questions that you might have. And I really appreciate your attention for this talk tonight. Okay. All right. Thank you, Angela. So I, I was actually, while you were talking about the grouper count, is there a website that I can share with everybody so that they know where to go to get the information? Yes. Um, well, the two ways, probably the easiest way is just my email. Um, oh, so yeah, I don't know if you can put that in the chat, but yes. maybe, yeah. And then if they want to find their local Sea Grant agent, that I encourage them to do that also. And the website for that is just flcgrant. Dot org. Okay. Awesome. Um, so a question that uh, came in was that we've seen um, a couple of the groupers on our side, um, they're tagged, but they also have like, it's, I think it's called the fin array that like, it's like a, like a piece of their dorsal is out. Yes. What is that and what is, what are they doing? Are you guys doing that? What, what's going on? There? Um, so no, that is, a, that is um, not, it, it, FWC might be involved in that one, but it, it, Chris Koenig and FSU's lab started that, and there might be some other researchers who are who are still pursuing it over there. I know FIU is doing some work, but the missing dorsal rays um, are taken as a non-lethal way to age the fish. Um, typically, to get a fish age, you've got to, it's lethal, right? Because you have to get the otolith out, and the otolith is a bone behind the brain. So you actually have to remove the brain to get the otolith out, and it's very accurate for aging fishes. Um, but there's non-lethal methods as well, including cross sections of fin rays and fin spines. So if you see Goliath grouper that are missing a bunch of those fin rays, it's they've probably have been caught as part of a research effort and their fin rays have been removed um, to see a general age pattern. Okay. Um, so question is, um, the Goliath groupers, we're obviously here as divers, if you've been a diver for many, many years here in South Florida, um, we've obviously seen the Goliath grouper aggregation on certain wrecks. Um, and over time, we've noticed that some of the animals have actually moved a bit. Um, you know, how, how much of the aggregation will 
stay on the sites versus they'll move over time? Is there any good data on that? Such a good question. Yeah. And the data um, that are available for that suggests that there are individuals that maintain residency at those spawning ag sites all the time. That's just their home wreck. They're lucky to live in the club, right? But then there's other individuals that are just sporadically present during spawning season. So it's a mix. Some of the individuals seem to stay there, um, but a lot of them will come in from other places and then move back and then they'll be detected back at the sites that they came from. Great yeah. question. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, you can go on some of these wrecks. I mean, year round, you can go on the caster uh, in Boynton and see at least one or two Goliath groupers. Um, we also have down in the uh, Pompano Beach area, there used to be one that like pretty much lived on the Ancient Mariner. Um, there was, there's a couple, there's like two that live on the United Caribbean. So it's, it's definitely, they've got some residents and then you've got the ones that, that travel in. And so um, it's kind of interesting because it, and I'm going to go back to a little bit of science nerdy stuff, but um, you know, I've been here 10 years and when I first got here, the lemon sharks aggregation would happen in the winter and it would be like these lines of lemon sharks that would lay on the bottom at certain dive spots. Now you're not seeing that anymore. And so it's interesting to watch uh, how the animals are using the topography and how much they're cha you know, changing. But we've noticed that there isn't as many Goliath groupers, at least I haven't noticed as many Goliath groupers. Like when I first started diving here, like, yes, on the caster last year, I maybe had about 40, but I mean, there'd be times that people are like, oh no, there's like 60 to like 80 of these guys. So is that just a fishing pressure thing or is that just maybe they're trying different sites to spawn? That's another really good question. And I don't know if I have a good answer for it other than both of those suggestions that you just said, right? So sometimes if they find another spot, if, if so the population is, slowly recovering right and so as you get more individuals within a certain area there's the potential that maybe they don't have to travel as far to get to that critical mass that they need for a spawning ag so it's possible and again this is something that could be answered with acoustic telemetry and tracking and you know following some of these individuals around but it's possible that some of the individuals that used to come to the the, the hot spot have found enough of their own in an area where they didn't have to travel as far and they've established a new spawning aggregation. But it's also possible that the mortality is increasing or there's been some sort of other event that has reduced the numbers. So it, it yeah, I don't know for sure, but it could be either of those things. Yeah, I mean, it also can be a, another factor is the water quality. Um, you know, if, if there's some something in the water that's making them less likely to want to hang out. There's also um, the, you know, food sources. Maybe they're not as plentiful like they used to be. And, you know, temperature. Um, mm -hmm. I know that some animals are very um, shy when it comes to temperatures being either they're too warm waters or the water's too cold. So, yeah. You know, and also I think, and this, I don't think it's as big of an issue on your side because the viz is so good where you are. But um, I think that, at some sites that are heavily visited, there there's sometimes the Goliath King can become more skittish and move out into the sand or away from like the main point of that site when the divers are in the water. So there's also the potential that as more people visit a spot, you know, they might become more shy and not as visible as they were before. <laughs> but yeah, well, if uh, if any of you guys watched last week, we had um, local photo professional. Wayne McWilliams on, and he did a presentation about wide angle photography, but he also hit on how to photograph these guys. Um, and one of the big things that he talked about is um, being nice and slow, um, not chasing these fish, because when you chase, they just go out into the sand. It makes it hard to like keep up with them and, and really see what they, uh, their personalities, because each one of them has different personalities. You've got ones that will be um, literally shy and they're kind of up on the sand and then you've got ones that will just like it seems like they're being lazy and they just lay down on the sand i'm not really sure what that behavior is they'll sit they will have you ever i don't know if you guys get it but we get it over here um where they almost get a little pit in the sand like so you can see uh, uh, like uh, around the perimeter of a lot of our shipwrecks these pits and the 
and the Goliath Cooper sometimes they're just they've they're sitting in them. They've made their own little hole, like little egg carton. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So, so we'll see those, and then you've got your supermodels, which are those rock star fish that really, for some reason, really want to hang out with you as a diaper. I mean. I can't even tell you how many times I've dove on some of these wrecks and there's ones that just come straight at me and they're like, Hey, Nicole, how's it going? What you doing? What's going on? Take my picture. Give me, give me some, you know, some love. And it's like, Whoa, this is a very <laughs> interesting behavior. Cause you would think they'd be scared um, of people and they're not. Yeah. Um, so going back to scared of people. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about the Goliath grouper grunting? The the sound that they make in yeah so that bass drum that bass drum boom that they make that is um the, they have a sonic muscle that is near their swim bladder that they can vibrate basically and make that that boom sound and they i've seen them do it in multiple scenarios i've seen them do it because they're spooked you know so if you like a lot of times I'll hear the boom and then see the cloud of dust because we spooked them and they're moving out. I've also seen them do it when they're eating um, both benthic food and bait. So I don't know if it might um, maybe make the predation event easier for them to like maybe stun the prey for a second while they're sucking it in. But I have, they don't do it every time they eat, but I have seen them do that, do that when they eat. And then I've also, um, I know that they can um, make noise um, when it's dark and they're in their spawning aggregations. So there's so it is a communication tool also. So just like humans with our voices, right? We use we use our voices to communicate a lot of different things. So I think Goliath Grouper, they, they can do that noise and they'll do it when they're spooked or when they're trying to talk to each other or maybe potentially for stunning food. Okay. Um, so talking about dark at night so you know some of us um you know don't really do a lot of night diving so we get told oh the best time to see when they actually do the spawning when they go and do their dances in the water column is at night during a full moon is that how we should be if you're interested in seeing that behavior is that we should be targeting for diving or is that kind of a, a, a an urban myth <laughs> well i don't know i mean we do know that a lot of the um, noise sound production does occur at nighttime when they're doing when they're in their spawning aggregations but I never recommend that people try to catch them in the act necessarily because it could be disruptive if there's a whole bunch of divers right in the you know when they're when they're trying to do their do their thing but um yeah I'm not answering the question very well I think it you have the potential, but I also think that shining lights and being there could potentially disrupt what's happening anyway. So you might not catch what you want to catch. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think just witnessing them during the day is one of the most phenomenal things at those spawning eggs because there's so many and they're grouped up and they all get like pointed in the same direction. And um, it's kind of a, I think, preferable to diving at night if that's the goal is to see the Goliath, right? Yeah, I know that there is a scientist over here that has like, their own um like i don't know how to explain it, like jar things that would like try and catch the the spawning and mm -hmm. use that to see if it happened at certain time periods i'm not really sure how that one <laughs> yeah that's how they validate an yeah. actual spawning ag is that you need to actually capture the release of egg and sperm at that spot mm -hmm. to, to show that they actually are spawning and not just like grouped up um, and so yeah if they capture the eggs and the sperm at that spot or recently fertilized um, egg, you have evidence for sure that that, that spawning activity is happening. And I think um, I remember maybe it was a few years ago now, there was a photographer in the Palm Beach area that maybe captured on camera um, spawning occurring. Because see, sometimes people see these guys and then they think, oh, I found spawning, but it really they're just pooping. So let's be honest, guys, like, that's great, but that's not spawning. So I think he actually captured it in that her, that scientist was able to verify that that was um, spawning. So that's. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's some of Chris's work, um, Chris Koenig's work or his team. Yeah. If I'm misspeaking, I'm sorry if I'm forgetting who it was, but I'm, okay. I'm, I'm almost positive that was Chris Koenig. Yeah. I We actually had Chris, he came down um, before COVID when we didn't do Facebook Lives in, uh, in <laughs> we did in-person uh, presentations and he came down and 
he gave a great presentation. So um, uh, maybe next time we'll have him on. But um, yeah, this has been fantastic. We, we got somebody who came in um, a little bit late and uh, somebody answered part of their question. But what kind of effects does the red tide have on these animals? Um, so Gol Goliath, that's a great question. I'm glad you asked it because we're experiencing a red tide over here on the west coast of Florida. Um, it seems to be happening more often these days and Goliath grouper are one of the species that's sensitive to it. So um, when we get an extended prolonged red tide um, that is you know, over a broad geographic area, we do get a lot of Goliath grouper mortality. Um, it, is an it is a good opportunity to sample for the fish because remember they're not harvested. So to get those otoliths and those gonads and things like that, if you get a fresh dead Goliath grouper, FWC absolutely uses as many of those individuals as they can to get life history data. Um, so that's just the point. If you ever see a dead one over there, let FWC know right away because they do sample dead Goliath. Not every dead fish, but Goliath grouper. Okay, awesome. All right, guys. So the moment you've been waiting for, we have, like I said, our... Oh, there we go. Uh, we have our online raffle. So if you registered on our Eventbrite, I grabbed all your guys' names and we are gonna do an online raffle. We are um, going to be raffling off. You get one free uh, trip on one of our event dives to go see the Goliath Grouper. And if you're the winner, I'll reach out to you and you let me know which day you wanna go. So let's go ahead and see who our big winner is. There's everyone's names and here we go. The winner is, let's see, bring it down, Michael Christianbury. Hopefully, Michael, you are watching at the moment. Give us a thumbs up. Get a woohoo. All right. So welcome, Michael, to winning our Facebook Live raffle for tonight and hope to get you out there diving with Goliath. Um, we just had one more question come in, so let's just go ahead and Answer, is overfishing primary reason for Goliath being on the international endangered species list? Yes, yeah, they've historically been overfished in all, all parts of their range. So um, yeah, yeah, the drop in population numbers impacted the population, not just in the US, but obviously throughout their geographic range. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so guys, um, remember that um, Goliaths are, are protected in Florida state waters. Florida state waters is from shoreline all the way out to three miles, at least here on the East Coast. On the West Coast, is it a different mileage? Yeah, nine miles here, but they're pr protected in federal waters too. Ah, so they're protected in federal waters. So there you go. So um, we had a question for you guys. Um, maybe most of you guys don't fish, but if you do or you do not have some fishing friends, um, Angela would like to know if anybody uh, sees baby Goliath groupers. So if you do, we want to know where you're seeing them at because they're very hard sometimes to find. And also they're very different looking than their adult phases. So um, Angela, you know, if they need to let you know, I sent your email. Um, it's in the comment section here so they can let you know where they're seeing them. And uh, <laughs> we uh, hopefully we'll get that answered. All right, so I, guys, I think we are all done here. Thank you so much, Angela. We appreciate this great presentation. Everyone wrote in, we've got people listening in from all over. We had someone from England on, so very Yay. cool. I know. All righty, guys, so like you, like you guys know, 4C, we love giving these presentations, so please make sure to check us out on our website to see what our next presentations are going to be. So thank you and have a great night. See ya. Thanks, guys.